previously mentioned, amino acids are the monomers for proteins. They are the building blocks of proteins. And you find 20 different amino acids out there. If you, you've seen when I talked about proteins and their monomers, is definitely going to be amino acids. And what happens is when I talk about a polymer, I'm saying that they have different building blocks binding together to form the actual polymer, the protein that we talk about. And these amino acids are bound to each other with this peptide bond. And what happens is that when you have two amino acids together, you call it a peptide. From two amino acids on, you call it a peptide. And going on nomenclature, you, if you have two amino acids, you call it dipeptide. This is for two amino acids. I'm going to, I'm going to do the abbreviations, the AA, two amino acids. And if you have three, you have a tripeptide. And these are for three amino acids. If you have for example, around eight amino acids, you call it oligopeptide, and that's eight amino acids. And then if you have more than ten, you start to call it a polypeptide. And that's between, let's say, ten to a hundred amino acids. When you start having more than 100 amino acids, you call it a protein. But proteins, oh, let me correct here. Proteins are definitely not as simple as just 100 amino acids together. And this is what we're going to talk about. I'm going to say more, more than 100 amino acids. They're not as simple as the linear shape that I just explained previously. They do, these amino acids are going to bind with these peptide bonds and form like a, a necklace, a bead necklace, uh, which has the shape of a line that continues, but these are going to form further bonds and they're going to form these pro this protein structure that we're going to talk about. So, we know that a protein is clearly a linear non-branching polypeptide chain, like it's formed out of a linear non-branching polypeptide chains. And these linear chains I just mentioned are these amino acids that are going to bind to one another and form the line molecule that I just explained. And they're not going to branch, so you're not going to see here another branch of this. So this is not going to happen. But they are polypeptide chains, a lot of amino acids together, but they're not reserved to this structure. This is not the structure of a protein. You're, you're not going to see a protein with a linear structure. This is not going to happen. What is going to happen is that this chain of amino acids have three levels, uh, four levels, excuse me, and this is what we talk about when we mention protein structure. You're going to see that a lot of times throughout your study, especially in biochemistry, molecular cell biology, you're always going to talk about protein structures. Um, and you are going to see four levels. And the first level is called primary structure. The second level is called secondary structure, tertiary, this is the ter third level structure, and then the last one is called quaternary. And I have a picture here that illustrates what I'm talking about, and I'm going to go in a little bit of detail on each type of structure, but I have here my my um, primary structure here. This is my primary structure, and then I have my secondary structure here. Oops, secondary structure here, 
and then tertiary structure and quaternary structure. These are the levels that you find in protein structure. And the final structure, the quaternary structure, is how you see a or how you find an active protein. This is how it looks. Uh, it's always in this quaternary structure. So the first level that I want to talk about in protein structure is the primary structure of a protein. And the primary structure is a very simple thing to, to know about. It's the sequence of amino acids. So that linear molecule that I just explained that you see here in this picture, I'm going to put some red so it's easier for you to see. So this line of amino acids bound to one another through peptide bonds is my primary structure in protein structure. So keep that in mind that whenever we talk about this type of structure, we're just saying that it's a line of amino acids bound to one another through peptide bonds. That's what I mean by primary structure. The secondary structure is when you have your primary structure, the first structure that we just talked about, and this structure is going to start folding or bending, however you would like to, to call it, but I would say that it's starting to fold and these amino acids are going to interact with each other and form hydrogen bonds. And this is how I end up with a secondary structure in my protein. And how, first thing I want to tell you before I, I go into a little bit more detail is that these hydrogen bonds stabilize, so they stabilize the, or these structure is stabilized by hydrogen bonds. Sorry, I had a blackout moment for a second there but what I wanted to say is that these secondary structures are stabilized by these hydrogen bonds that happen here and how does these um, how do these um, H bonds happen between these amino acids? Well, if you learn a little bit more about the peptide bonds that I explained previously, you're going to see that here, somewhere around here on this amino acid, and somewhere around here on this amino acid, you are left with a carbon and an oxygen from the carboxyl group after the bond is um, formed. And then on the other amino acid, you're going to be left with a nitrogen and a hydrogen after the bond is formed. And what happens if you learn from basic chemistry is that here the hydrogen usually has a, a positive a charge and uh, the hyd uh, the oxygen has a more negative charge and this is why this bond, they kind of approach one another and form a bond called hydrogen bond. And this is what we see happening in the secondary structures that when this primary structure bends is going to start forming hydrogen bonds between the amino acids and this is what we see here. So another thing I would like to tell you about secondary structure is that you find two different types of secondary structures. There's one called beta sheet and another one called alpha helix. And alpha helix, as the name indicates, is going to form a alpha or a helix shape, sorry. And you can see here in this picture, it clearly shows these loops forming in the secondary structure. And the beta sheet, although not very clear here, you can see that the molecule, the linear molecule, is going to start bending in one way, one direction, and then another direction, and another direction. I think the best way to describe this is that if you've seen a pleated skirt, this looks a little bit like a pleated skirt with the different directions of the molecule going in opposite directions, but still in a very, a let's say, very uh, um, flat manner, not like in the helix shape where you have loops being formed. And 
so keep that in mind, but we're also going to see that the hydrogen bonds in the alpha helix are going to be formed between the loops here. This is how this structure is stabilized. And in the beta sheet or the pleated skirt here, you're going to see that the hydrogen bonds are going to be formed between these pleats or these um, these bends or the, 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 where the molecule bends. And we're going to see this in more detail. I'm going to show you actual molecules uh, in more detail where you see that. And this is what I'm going to do next. Secondary structure of proteins. And I have the two types that I just talked about. And I wonder if you can guess which one is which. Well, your time is up. What I, I have here on my left, on, on your left, is a alpha helix. And on my right, or on your right as well, you have a beta sheet. Okay? Clearly you see here that on my alpha helix, I have the spiral shape going on here and I have amino acids and for every loop I have here that I have 3.5 amino acids and this is more or less the average per loop of amino acids and you can see here the hydrogen bonds being formed between uh, oxygen I'm assuming this is an oxygen here and this is a hydrogen so this is a hydrogen here, and these are being stabilized, this structure is being stabilized by all these hydrogen bonds that you can see throughout this molecule. And you can see that somewhere here that these amino acids on this shape here, they are bound to one another with peptide bonds. So this is my alpha helix, and if I look at my beta sheet, it's the same shape that I explained previously, like going up, going down, then I should have another one here, another one there. Wow, I'm a great artist, as you can see. But what I want to explain here is that there are hydrogen bonds between these bands or between these pleats. And what I see is that my oxygen is here. So this is my oxygen and another hydrogen of another amino acid. This is a hydrogen. And I have my hydrogen bond being formed between these, and this is how this structure is stabilized. So I wanted you to have a clearer view of how this looks at a molecular level. Now it's time to talk about the tertiary structure. This is the next level after, right after the secondary structure, where you will start forming a three-dimensional structure of the protein. And you have here the picture that illustrates now. And you can clearly see that I have here many with these red arrows uh, showing the beta sheets and several alpha helices also shown here in the green with green here you can see here and what happens is this this um, this three or tertiary structure will happen when folding of the polypeptide chain as a result of interactions between um, the side chains of amino acids that lie uh, in different regions of the primary structure that we see here and the side chains as you learned previously is that uh, these chains here, if I draw another amino acid here. So my side chain, th this interaction, the interactions found in the tertiary structure are going to happen here between these groups, the side chains. And there are many types of interactions that can happen. If you looked previously when I showed you clear images of the molecular structures of amino acids, you can see there are different types of side chains and therefore many types of bonds can happen between these side chains. And if you look here, I already have a list, so I won't 
bore you writing them, it, writing it down. And I have a list of many forms, many forms of bonds that can help stabilize the tertiary structure. And I have ionic bonds, nonpolar bonds, van der Waals interactions, hydrogen bonds, and disulfide bonds. You can clearly have a look in your chemistry notes and understand a little bit more if you want more detail on these but this is the type these are the types of bonds that you're going to have between the side chains of the amino acids that will go on and form more um, bonds and form a three-dimensional structure and this is what we mean by tertiary structure so there are some things that you need to know about tertiary structure of a protein and these two things that I want to talk about very briefly is uh, the definition of a domain, which I already have three things here that are important to mention about domains that happen in tertiary when you have a tertiary structure in the protein. And these are basic units of tertiary structures. And they're the functioning part of a protein. And proteins may have many domains, so keep that in mind that the domain is the basic unit of ter tertiary structure. And every time you talk about a domain or you hear about a domain, just have keep that in mind. And you cannot see clearly here the example, but I, I try to draw something here for you which is the domain structure of insulin receptor, which uh, are proteins. Uh, the insulin receptor is definitely a protein. And what you see here is that there are different domains that have different functions. And you can see that this area here, for example, this area here is called the hormone binding and I'm going to write D for domain. So this is the hormone binding domain. This is the function of this domain. And another part or another domain you can clearly see here is called a transmembrane domain. Okay, this is this region here that uh, you can see that crosses the, the cell's membrane. So it is transmembrane because it is crossing the membrane here. Uh, this is the two yellow lines, the four yellow lines are trying to uh, be my cell's membrane. But you can get an idea of what domain means in the tertiary structure. Another domain that you can see here is this one, which is the catalytic or catalytic, sorry, catalytic domain. And this is this domain that you can see here. And I have my N's and my C's here, which I don't know if you remember from the, the tutorial where I explained the, the N terminus. So these are terminus. This is my N terminus that goes all the way, amino acids going this way, this way, this way, until I have a C terminus, that's the opposite side of my, the other end of the, the line that I have here. And this is where I have a carboxyl or a carbon uh, free here, no binding, that is not binding to any amino acid. And same thing here on this side, I don't have any amino acid binding to my N or to my amino group. That's why I have an N and a C and you can clearly observe on these domains that I have N, several N terminus and several C terminus as well. This is what I wanted to talk about when you speak about domain. This is the basic units of tertiary structures. Another thing I would like to talk about is chaperones. Very brief discussion on chaperones, but you have to understand these proteins are actually going to facilitate the correct folding or assembly of other proteins. And you're going to see these types of proteins in many other reactions, maybe other tutorials as well. But for now, I just want you to have an idea that these proteins have a very important function when it comes to, um, to form this tertiary structure in proteins, because it is here that you need to do the correct folding and assembly of proteins, because if they do not have 
have uh, uh, the, the right folding and assembly, these proteins can lose their function. They can become inactive. Uh, so they need to be folded and assembled correctly, uh, correctly so you can have them as active proteins so they can perform the functions they're created or they're made for or they they're they're projected for so keep that in mind that chaperones are helping the the formation of a tertiary structure in proteins this is our last level of protein structure the quaternary structure let's call it the last level because you go from the primary secondary and tertiary to a final one here that I have as a hemoglobin. Don't know if you heard about this. This is the protein found in your red blood cells that carries oxygen. You can learn a little bit more and you're going to learn a little bit more in medical school. Uh, but what I need to explain here in my protein structure is that you can see in hemoglobin as an example that my quaternary structure is comprised of different polypeptide chains interacting with each other. And these polypeptide chains are those domains that I talked about. So you find four domains four polypeptide chains in hemoglobin, for example, that interact with each other and form a, what we call a quaternary structure. So a quaternary structure, going to write here, is interactions between polypeptide chains. And this is usually the, the final or the last stage of uh, proteins. That w This is how we find proteins. And proteins usually have more than one polypeptide chain. So proteins, I'm going to write here down so you can have that written. Uh, proteins have more than one polypeptide chain. And I wanted to give you an example. I think this is an excellent example because you will see this uh, used as the easiest way to, expl uh, to explain and describe this type of structure, the quaternary structure, which is the hemoglobin uh, structure. It's very simple and as you can see four different colors that represent four different uh, domains or four different polypeptide chains. Mm -hmm.